everybody, it's Terry. Uh, we had some technical problems earlier, so I thought I would try and re-record this for you. So um, I may be going fast, and I apologize for that, but I'm trying to get out of here. <laughs> okay, so uh, our topic today is uh, This Is Me, The Social Self, and The Social Selfie. I am going to scroll. Okay, we uh, only had one reading today which was the one called What Does the Selfie Say? And I didn't pick it, Anthony picked it, but I was one of the co-writers on it. Um, there's another piece I'm going to talk a lot about, so I included the citation here. It's by uh, someone named Alice Marwick, and it has to do with online identity. I did that because a lot of the questions on iLearn uh, turned on notions of online identity, and the selfie piece dealt with some of those, but not others, so I thought, let's just get it all handled. You're not responsible for reading that piece, although you're more than welcome to it, just write me and I'll send it to you. Okay? Let's see what we've got here. So, our agenda is as follows. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to think about uh, the concept of identity, which obviously uh, pre-existed social media. Uh, every once in a while you might see some weird thing pop up on my screen here. Uh, and then we're going to think about uh, online identity. And while we're doing that, I want you to understand that uh, it's not that we have one sort of identity online and one sort of identity offline. It's that we start to deal with layers. Okay, and then we're going to add in the idea of the selfie, and of course what's interesting about that is the word self. And uh, finally we're going to go back to that question of how to see visual events in social media, and I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about uh, a concept that's introduced in the selfie piece uh, called the grab. Alright, so the first thing uh, has to do with thinking about the self, some notes on identity. So what do we mean when we talk about identity? Well, if uh, you listen to somebody like Alice Morwick explain it, identity can mean one of three things often inter interlocking. The first would be subjectivity, that is how we feel about ourselves and how we think about ourselves. The next one would be representation, which has to do with uh, images that we see uh, of ourselves or that we create our perception of self in relation to. And the third would be the concept of self-presentation. If you think about the difference between representation and self-representation, I would say the difference between spectating images and, and creating images. And obviously it's more than just images. When we talk about identity, we have, we have discourse, we have sound, we have touch, we have all kinds of things, but this is a visual culture class, so we're going to stay with uh, the visual. And identity exists at least in two forms. We have our personal identities, and then we have groups that we, uh, that we identify with or that we identify um, against. So classic theories of identity, uh, there's lots of them. We're going to talk about four, and you don't have to have known this before. We're just sort of laying it out for you to think about. The first one is the concept that identity is multiple and performed for audiences. The next theory uh, talks about identity as habitual and performative rather than essential and biological. The third theory uh, is called intersectionality, and it has to do with the power relations that are part of any identity construction. The fourth is the argument that increasingly we construct identities like projects. We work on them, and uh, because we live in late capitalism, those projects are alternately conceptualized as creative or consumerist. Okay. So let's take a look at each of these in a little more detail. The first is the idea that identity is multiple and performed. Now that idea uh, comes from sociologist Irving Goffman, who did a lot of amazing stuff during the 50s. Uh, in some ways, uh, he is similar in who he was interested in studying 
he started off with the kind of outskirts of society, a little like Michel Foucault, if you remember him. Uh, but where Foucault spent a lot of time in historical archives, Goffman was looking at everyday people. So he studied things like stigma, and he studied um, outcasts, and he studied um, deviants, but he's probably best known for studying people in everyday arrangements. And he argued that people tend to present their identity differently based on the context, where they are, and audience, who they're with. Now, if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. If I am talking to you, I'm going to get one sort of version of you. And if you are talking to your best friend or your boo, uh, they're going to get a very different, I hope, they're going to get a very different version of you. Uh, if I went to you in a moment while you were having a romantic dinner and said, oh, you're, you're being very inauthentic, this is not the you I know, that would be kind of ridiculous because the you I know is different from the you they know, which doesn't mean that you're schizophrenic, it means that identity is multiple and it's uh, played out almost like you're on a stage. Uh, Goffman wrote a lot about what he called the front stage and the backstage behaviors that we all engage in every day. So uh, this leads to the concept that multiplicity is inherent in identity. You're never just one thing. Even by yourself, even with your friends, you're never one thing, okay? The next issue has to do with identity as both habitual and performative. This is an, uh, an argument that took a root um, in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, a lot of people, but one person in particular that uh, people talk about is a, a theorist and a philosopher named Judith Butler. And her argument was that rather than uh, she dealt specifically with gender, and her argument was rather than gender being something that was essential, uh, natural, consistent across different people, she argued that actually we might have things like hormones and endocrines and body parts. Th that was true. But what we knew as being male or being female or being masculine or being feminine all of those things were a series of habitual and learned behaviors. And she called those behaviors performative. And the difference between performance, which we were just talking about, and performativity in general is that performance tends to be much more um, uh, conscious. So you know when you're interacting with your teacher that there's a different you than when you're doing something with your friend. When we talk about something like gender and later race and sexuality and anything that's been argued as discourse, what we're dealing with is, is a series of conscious and unconscious behaviors that some of which we've come up with ourselves, but most of which have been sort of handed down to us, whether it's about um, knowing what a feminine and masculine haircut is, or people picking out pink and blue clothes. And if you think that this is um, overstated, you might take a look at some of the literature that's been done about all of the surgeries that happen to infant children uh, very soon after birth who have ambiguous uh, genitalia. And there's more than you would think. And the argument for performing uh, surgeries on these children is it's going to be for the good of the child to make their um, their gender less ambiguous to pick a side so to speak so many many decisions are made on our behalf before we even have choices about uh, our identity and in that regard uh, they match Judith Butler's idea about performativity okay now the next one, and you can see they're kind of building off one another, is uh, the idea of identity as intersectional and power-based. Now again, I want to point out that it's not just, I don't want you to be thinking, oh, I'll choose between identity as performance versus identity as performativity. No, you can be doing all of those things all at the same time. In a similar way, identity is intersectional. 
Intersectionality refers to the multiple intertwining facets of personal and social identity. So um, your personal identity could be, you know, I'm emo, I like a certain kind of music, um, chocolate is my favorite ice cream. Your social identity could be, I have this particular gender, I have this particular sexuality, I have this particular race, I have this particular uh, uh, nationality or faith, right? And all of these things become quite hard to separate from one another. What's important to know about that is in power relations, you often get asked to pick. Pick what's more important, or it's assigned to you. So um, anyone of mixed race can tell you that there's always a moment in the conversation where somebody says, uh, well, what do you really, what's, what are your main, what's your main thing? Right? It causes a lot of cultural anxiety to say, well, all things are, are, are equal. The nature of power is that uh, one force will, will push against another. What's important for our purposes is that um, regardless of what you think is the most important factor, uh, there's also realities um, and discourses, dominant and counter-dominant, around your world. So um, one example I can give is um, you can say, uh, I identify as gay and it doesn't matter um, that I'm also uh, uh, a very religious Christian, but if you walk into a Christian church and start talking about being gay, you may get some pushback from that, right? Because now you have to decide which set of values are you going to embrace. And also remember that dominant identities shift depending on time frame, depending on geography. So if you, um, in my country, America, uh, there is a, uh, there was a recent poll that said uh, the majority of Christians feel themselves to be discriminated against. I don't but uh, if you went to a place like um, uh, Abu Dhabi, where uh, the majority of folks are not Christian, and let's say you were also on top of that um, uh, South Asian, and you were, you know, uh, an, a Christian and Indian, and working in the Gulf would you possibly be discriminated against? Yes, because your faith and your race were not the dominant in, in, in the place in which you uh, were. So now let's move, now that we've thought about identity in general, let's think about online identity. And one of the things I want to suggest to you is that increasingly, I'm not even sure if in five years we're going to be talking about online and offline. Why? Two reasons. First of all, people are spending more time um, uh, using social media with people they know offline. So, you know, if you have a fight on Snapchat with your brother and then you come home for dinner, he's not going to say, uh, oh, don't worry, that's just the internet, it doesn't matter. No, you, you had a fight. Uh, the other thing is that offline increasingly is never offline because we're expected to be uh, connected 24-7. And um, more to the point, uh, if you have a phone uh, that has trackability, which is to say every single phone, you're always kind of connected into a grid. Mark Andreevic likes to say every single phone is a drone at this point. Um, so with that, I want to talk about the internet before and after images and how identity worked. Um, so around 1994 is when the, the web hits big and images become part of how people experience uh, the internet. But of course, before that, it was all sort of CRT terminals and text. Uh, and you really didn't know who was on the other end of the screen. So we have the sort of famous... Uh, cartoon here on the internet nobody knows you're a dog right and you've got the one dog saying that to the other dog and he's presumably typing to a person or I don't know uh, and that was sort of the original conception and along with that um, along with a lot of kind of fraud was this hope that we might 
if we were in an environment where looks weren't so um, important because they weren't there, we might be able to transcend things, transcend things like racism and sexism and all, all of those sort of image-based uh, issues. I can tell you because I was there, I'm that old, um, that's not what happened. In a world where you could be anything, it seemed like most people chose to speak when they were debating as sort of 35 year old white men and when they were sort of in fantasy spaces flirting it was a bunch of 35 year old white men pretending to be 16 year old white women so um i'll just let you sit with that so we went though when when images showed up we kind of went from this situation to what i call um this right so here you have the same dog well not the same dog but you know i told her i was a pit bull catfish so it's not that fraud can't exist it's not that misrepresentation can't exist um it's not that our ideas about what is the, the dominant discourse about even what a sexy dog is don't exist uh it's that we we use images to sort of work around all right so let's think about how online identity, theories of online identity, have gotten complicated. And again, I want you to remember that it's not that this changes theories of offline identity, it's almost that it thickens it, right? Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four. The first is we have begun thinking about identity as part of a larger techno-human assemblage. Now that sounds very fancy, but I will get to it, I promise. The next uh, theoretical development was the idea that identity is increasingly modulated, not just by our geography and our friends and our time, but also by technological platforms. So we might behave a different way in a place like um, Instagram than we do in a place like Snapchat, in a place, in a place like uh, YouTube, etc. Um, the third is uh, this idea that increasingly identity becomes a kind of taste performance as a form of capital, um, which is a little bit about uh, similar to the idea of identity as a project. So we're going to get a little deeper in that in a minute. And then finally, uh, online identity is often experienced as kind of a demand for authenticity in the face of context collapse. And again, we're going to talk about those two in a second. So let's go to the first one. So assemblage is a fancy word. It was coined by a, a French philosopher named Gilles Deleuze, and it basically means the intertwining nature of networked environments. See, it almost looks like assembly that are hard to separate from one another. So if you think about um, online life, you can think about what do we have? We have individual users, those are humans. You can have groups of users, those are kind of social formations. You can have the companies that are running the platforms and the uh, electricity grids, etc. There are the governments that are doing things like um, censoring or um, uh, shoveling money into certain kinds of technologies. There are things like the software choices uh, that each uh, platform is making. Uh, there are the hardware uh, that each one of us, devices that each one of us are, are sort of carrying around that alters how we experience things. There's all, also things like electrical grids, and I was telling the students in, in the lecture that when I was working in Ghana, which is in West Africa, the at the time there was all this talk about um, uh, one laptop per child. It was like the big thing. And a lot of the aid workers were like, yeah, that's really great. How about if the electricity doesn't go out every six hours? So there's a lot of things that we might take for granted that when they work best, we don't even know they're working, but they're all part of this system. I think of assemblage as almost like the machine human flip of intersectionality because um, intersectionality is about all of these different overlapping features of my identity, right? So if you think about that, and then think about that within a, like a larger kind of cluster, 
of all these other people with their identities, but in addition, corporations and governments and hardware and electrical grids. So we're, we're kind of part of all of that. So in addition to that, let's drill down on one of those, which is the idea of platforms. So we talked a lot about platforms last week, but um, platforms can modulate, can alter uh, our identity expression in a bunch of ways. The first way would be through technological platform uh, affordances. So um, there's a reason we're goofy on something like Snapchat. It's because it's got all this kind of funny augmented reality filters and stuff. Um, there are, uh, there's a reason why we want verification on a banking uh, service because we don't want anybody just announcing they're us and using a credit card, right? The next one would be corporate rules about what's right and appropriate for a platform. So I might have a violent video and I want, might want to show it, but I might not go to YouTube because they're going to kick that content off. So I might go to one of those hip hop star places. Right? So every platform has its own sort of corporate rules in the terms of service. Then there's social norms. And in the uh, lecture, I, I asked people, who gets angry at people who post more than once a day on, on Instagram? And all these people raise their hand. And I'm like, when did this law get passed? It's a social norm. It's what people expect. Uh, and then the last one would be personal perceptions regarding audiences on platforms. So if you, uh, if you have a friend who's the kind of person that tags you in all these photos and you think that's really funny on Facebook, but then you go to LinkedIn and you realize, oh no, my Facebook uh, profile is visible from LinkedIn and I'm looking for a job, you might go back and untag yourself, right? Because you are trying to um, use the platform in a way that uh, helps you manage those personal perceptions. So then this is one of my favorite ones. It's the idea that identity is a project, right? And online, one of the ways that we perform that project and garden that project is through taste performances. So taste performance is a practice where people use a variety of digital symbols like pictures or avatars or icons or nicknames or fonts or memes or video to represent themselves. And um, if you think about your avatars or, or photos. Some of you may have the same one across every single platform. Even that is saying something. Sometimes you're saying, I can't be bothered to change it, right? Again, each one of these is a sort of, a, it's a signal. So we can think about taste performance as capital in three ways. And we talked about capital last week, particularly with social and fiscal capital, but I'm going to add cultural capital to this. So cultural capital is a way to talk about um, a performance that you would give socially to indicate your status, your, um, your class. And um, one way to do that is to say, you know, I'm cultured, I go to the opera, or, you know, I'm smart, I have a university degree, or you might say, I'm cool, I know all the funniest memes, or um, I'm authentic because, you know, here's my no makeup selfie and I keep it real. Um, whatever whatever uh, is working in, in your social milieu, right? That's called cultural capital. It's a way to say, like, I might not be rich, but I could be cool. I might not be rich, but I could be... Um, smart, right? Social capital is uh, the kind of capital you accrue by forming connections to people. And when you're doing taste performance, you would be doing it by, you know, you look at somebody else's uh, performance or you have your own sort of performance and somebody says to you, oh, I like that band too, or maybe you say that to them and then you have a bond together. Okay, so cultural capital, in terms of taste performance, think of it as I'm performing cool. Social capital, I'm performing connections or the desire for connections. And fiscal capital generally happens by way of uh, platform monetizations, which we talked about a lot last week. So um, every one of those boxes you check, those things you post, those things you like, each one of those is being tracked and monetized and sold to advertisers. So um, 
it behooves the platforms to keep you going doing that stuff. And finally, there is the idea of identity as a demand for authenticity uh, as, a re as a response to context collapse. So first, let's talk about context collapse. Context collapse is the theory that when you're in a socially mediated environment, it's actually harder to change up your presentations quickly. Uh, and that is because when you are offline, you tend to have identity presentations in a one-to-one -one or maybe maybe tops like one to like ten unless you're a performer but when you're in a social media environment you're transmitting information to all kinds of different people simultaneously and they might be experiencing you one person is experiencing you as a classmate another is experiencing you as their girlfriend another is experiencing you as their son or daughter another is experiencing you as somebody they might hire you you have all these people who who are approaching you under different contexts and this can be uh can cause a crisis of authenticity, generally among the, the viewer. So um, if you, I had this example when your friends tag you in a photo that's seen and objected to by your mom, right? So that's sort of a classic one. But there's also ones um, uh, where somebody will say, uh, oh, I'm just emailing you to confirm something. Oh, sorry. Um, and there's also a situation where somebody will say, I just don't think that you're being very um, real uh, on your Instagram account. And then somebody else who's also your friend will be like, why would you say that? And they go, oh, because they never do X and Y in real life. And then the other friend is like, yeah, actually they do that all the time. So what you're seeing is this multiplicity um, that that's kind of manage more one-to-one -one. offline online it tends to get all uh, messy so now that we've done all that I want us to think about selfies and I want us to think about selfies as they express and contain the notion of the self so one of the things that's interesting about selfies and um, I said to the other class I write on this stuff and I'm not interested in getting into a large conversation about is this a selfie but what about this but what about this I have a very broad conception of a selfie and to me a selfie is any photograph that foregrounds the viewer as excuse me the photographer as the point of view uh, I feel like if you have a, a compilation from a Fitbit and it tells you how much you exercised that day and, it, and you arranged it to monitor all of that, that's a selfie as far as I'm concerned. But uh, for right now, let's think about selfies as a kind of image that circulates online. I think that's the most useful way for us to think about this going forward, given the topic of the class. So a selfie is, it's a digital object that's transmitting feeling as relationship. So we'll get to that in a minute. It's also a communications practice that transmits a range of messages as gestures, right? Um, so that's a communications practice. That's a gesture, right? We know what that is. It's also an assemblage, back to that word, of human and non-human actors. So let's go ahead and look at that. So the first one is the idea that a selfie is an object. It's a digital object. And it's an object that expresses a relationship. What kind of relationship and to whom is this relationship or to what is this relationship um, circulating? I would say it, it, it has a bunch of different levels. So the first one would be the photographer and the photographed. So right now I'm giving this talk and I'm doing, um, I've got a, a, what do you call it? Um, mm, the thing that makes your face. It's, I've lost my mind. Um, I'll remember in a minute. You guys are probably all filling it in. Uh, I've got it going so you can see, you know, my face talking to you. It's very hard not to look at myself. And I'm sure you've had this experience on Skype and other things. Uh, that would be the relationship between the photographer and the photographed. Okay. Then there's the a relationship between the image, that is what the sensor of the camera is seeing or what the viewer is seeing. Uh, what the photographer's seeing, 
and the filtering software. And more and more I tell people it's not just um, you know, Instagram filters or whatnot. If you use something like um, a Google Pixel camera, they are building algorithms within the cameras that decide in advance for you what a good shot would be and construct it that way. So there are a lot of relationships going on that are somewhat invisible that actually yield our visibility. There's also a relationship with selfies between the viewer and the viewed. Obviously when we uh, put our selfies out into the world, on social media and whatnot, there's the viewer and the viewed, but I also want you to realize that anytime you take a photo and you have it on something like this, there's that magic place called the cloud. Someone's able to view that more than you, right? So it's, it's not just uh, you and your friends, it's you and this entire apparatus. So uh, there's also, of course, the relationship between individuals circulating these images back and forth. And then there's uh, relationships between users and the social software architectures, the platforms. So now let's talk about selfie as a communications practice. So it's a thing, and it's a thing that's in, in the middle of a lot of relationships, and it's also a practice, right? Uh, sometimes the act of taking a selfie and sending a selfie is so much more important than the selfie itself. Why? Because this is an image that can send a lot of different kinds of messages to different individuals or communities or audiences. And that's a gesture that can be dampened or amplified or modified by things like uh, censorship, you know, you may just think it's a picture of you breastfeeding and then uh, a platform decides that, no, that's a form of pornography. Or you uh, may think, I'm showing off this really cute bathing suit, if you remember the Instagram fatness article, and a whole bunch of people jump on uh, a social network site and say, oh my god, you're obscene, how could you even wear that? Um, you could uh, send something that you think is, uh, you, you think you're having this conversation with your, you know, your boo, and then you send them some sexy selfie, and then they send you something that's like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? And so it, you could have misread the original intent of what was being sent to you. Uh, and of course, we can always add things to uh, the mix. This is like when people make something into a meme, or they draw on it, or they put a filter, etc. Now, selfie is also an example of assemblage, as anything going around the internet is. So, here are five overlapping elements of selfie assemblage. The first, we would have the humans, right, taking the photos and looking at things. Then you would have the images that are produced and consumed. Then you would have the physical spaces in which the representation and the spectatorship transpire because those are very different things. If you're taking a selfie and you're a soldier on the battlefield and I'm looking at it from the comfort of my own home, those are different environments. We have the devices that are being used and we have the networks through which they circulate. So I want to talk very quickly about pathology and panic around selfies because that's something that you hear a lot about in the news. Um, so I have here every month or so you get a news article talking about selfies and narcissism or body dysmorphia which is when you have a sort of a war perception of what your body looks like, even psychosis. Uh, my favorite accidental deaths caused by a preoccupation with the camera. It's interesting that most of the pieces on narcissism uh, talk about women and selfies and most of the pieces on accidental death uh, and sort of extreme sports type selfies um, are about men. And I find it extremely interesting that the latter is not categorized as narcissism. I'm not really sure what's more self-involved than dying because you had to get yourself in a particular shot. But let's talk about this narcissism thing. Um, I'm going to quote from my own piece, sorry, but... All right, perhaps the most obvious of, uh, argument to be made against conceptualizing selfies as only acts of vanity or narcissism is the fact that as a genre, selfies are far more than stereotypical girls making duck faces in their bathrooms. When people pose for political selfies or joke selfies, sports-related selfies, fan-related selfies, 
illness-related selfies, soldier selfies, crime selfies, selfies at funerals, or selfies at places like museums, we need more accurate language than that afforded by 19th century psychoanalysis to speak about what people believe themselves to be doing and what response they're hoping to elicit. And then here's the second one, which you may or may not know about. So more and more, you've got these individual cases of abuse, right, that are being reported by private doctors who sort of make a condition, you know, selfie disorder, and then they start to treat that condition. And then many of them show up in the news, and they sort of make a cottage industry for themselves, even though the literature doesn't bear out, the scientific literature doesn't actually bear out a lot of what they're sort of arguing for. I also want to introduce the concept of moral panic to you, which you may or may not know. So a moral panic is, um, well, I have it here, so we'll, I'll just quote it. In the language of sociology, patho pathology-based rhetoric, that is disease kind of rhetoric, about selfies tend to re resemble what Stanley Cohen calls a moral panic. As Cohen points out, moral panics tend to heighten when a particular media form or practice is adopted by young people, women, or people of color. According to Stuart Hall, media panics always, almost always act as smoke screens, deflecting conversations that would be more dangerous to those in authority. So um, Cohen especially has this idea that um, there are two kinds of um, there are two kinds of players in social panics. There are what he calls moral entrepreneurs, and these are sort of newspapers or doctors or uh, people who announce this is something to get very, very upset about. And then there are what he calls folk devils, which are the, the thing that has to be uh, protected against or worried for. And so um, we see this happen a lot uh, in selfie discourse, where you hear, oh, you know, nobody cares about one another, we're all becoming self-absorbed, um, and then, of course, the children. So here are some common statements about moral panics and selfies. The first one would be, selfies encourage dangerous sexual display among young women. The first hint that this is a moral panic is that it's very rarely used uh, to describe the sexual display of young men. Most people don't go, oh my god, there's a dick pic of you on the internet. You'll probably never get married or have a job or how will anybody respect you again? So instantly you see when one part of the population is being, um, I would call it concern trolled, that's something to kind of prick your ears up about. The second one would be, uh, oh, selfies are encouraging violence among young men. All these kids, they just want to, like, you know, uh, video themselves having fights and robbing banks, etc. But it tends to be young men who get focused on all the time. And then the, uh, the third one would be, oh, selfies are endangering children because they're exposing them, of all genders, because they're exposing them to sexual predators. Now, this is an interesting example of... Um, Stuart Hall's idea about a covering up of a sort of a more difficult thing to talk about. Are there sexual predators on the internet? Yeah, sure. Uh, is that where even 10% of the abuse, sexual abuse of young people comes from statistically? No. The statistics tell us that sexual abuse happens mainly within the home, close family, friends, or the general neighborhood. It's not a stranger danger situation, but if you compare the amount of coverage about internet predators to the amount of coverage about the more sort of boring but prevalent uh, construction of abuse, there, there is no comparison. So again, this is where you start to get into moral panic territory. So there's another argument about selfies, and it's less about panic and it's more about a fear. And, understandable fear, but I want to talk about it a little more deeply. The first one has to do with, I call it the objectification argument. And it's a little bit of a continuation of what we were uh, talking about with regard to the Pornland uh, piece. And it goes like this. The first one is, selfies perpetuate sexist viewing patterns. They extend a long tradition in art history where women are um, the, the objects rather than the subjects, and they extend a traditional film uh, 
paradigm where women appear primarily as an artifact of what, what Laura Mulvey calls the male gaze, right? The scopophilic gaze. Um, there are many pushbacks against this argument in film and elsewhere, but I would say for our purposes, for social media, this is what I would say. Today, uh, we all can produce material, distribute it in many-to-many -many fashion rather than one way, as is the case for film and television, and court rather than silence viewer interaction. So who is the object in these scenarios and who is the subject? Now I'm not saying that objectification in its older sense doesn't exist. I'm saying there's more levels to that, more layers that complicate any kind of purely objectifying argument. There's also another argument I call the empowerment argument, and sometimes an argument for, and sometimes it's an argument against, and I think there's problems with both of them. And it would be about selfies, but you could talk about social media in general. Uh, so selfies are empowering because they let people tell their own stories, they let people connect over a distance, um, they're a new way of communicating, etc. Selfies are disempowering because they're objectifying, because they encourage sexual display, because they, um, they encourage self-absorption, because they're so image-based that nobody ever talks to one another anymore, right? Okay, so you have these arguments on both sides. I would say what's missing here is an understanding of not selfies, but empowerment or power. So power takes multiple forms, and when people are talking about how something feels empowering or disempowering, often they're talking about the psychological notion of power, which is important, right? It's about subjectivity. So when most people talk about feeling empowered, they're referencing a psychological experience where they feel maybe more at ease with themselves, so they can take more action in their daily lives. So, you know, they, don't, they feel less... Um, self-conscious or whatever it is. But of course there's other valences of power that all sort of sit on top of psychological power. So you've got social power, your power with to leverage groups, you've got economic power that has to do with physical capital, and you've got political power which has to do with governance. So here's where, again, we're back to this notion of intersectionality because it matters. So I'm just going to quote this because uh, I think it makes sense. Uh, the intersectional dimensions of power matter. I might feel psychologically empowered by feminist rhetoric or a selfie that's about feminism, but that does not stop legislators from passing laws about what I can and cannot do with my own body or ensure me equal pay. So in other words, I can feel personally empowered as a feminist, but that my governmental structure might not reflect that or my economic structure might not reflect that. Conversely, the fact that a white person feels what she perceives as a psychologically disempowering phenomenon known as reverse racism does not mitigate her actual social power to be free from racist scrutiny while walking into a convenience store. So I might feel the world is full of reverse racism and I'm being persecuted, but that and, and those might be real feelings, but they also don't match the facts on the ground about how many people are socially surveilled uh, when they walk into a convenience store because they are white versus how many are socially surveilled when they are non-white. Um, and we can go on, right? So intersectionality matters. I made this chart and I just find it super useful. Um, anytime you have a conversation with anybody about self-esteem or self-worth or empowerment and social media, right? So, uh, social media disempowers us, social media empowers us. What we really want to do is drill down on this notion of us and understand that the, that the us, the identity of the us, the identity of the me within the us is always predicated on all of these issues that I mentioned here. We've got uh, racial identification, we've got uh, gender, we've got sexual, we've got class base, we've got social discourses around things like uh, appropriate emotional behavior or appropriate healthy body size, etc, etc. We've got institutional stuff, and that's on the self-esteem side. And then we've got the social media side, which involves institutional control, 
Uh, we've got state control, censorship, surveillance. We've got corporate control, what's legal and permissible. We've got technical control. So you see how we have all of these things intersecting. So the last thing I want to talk to you a little bit about, and you might find it of use in your own work, has to do with uh, I, what I call a theory of the grab. And it was my way of pushing back against this idea of um, the gaze, the male gaze, the white gaze. And again, I think there's times where those constructions are very, very important. But I think there's other things going on in social media, and the gaze wasn't really enough to hold those. So here I'm going to read off this for you. Semft, that's me, has argued that social media viewers tend to consume visual material not by gazing, as one would a traditional film shown in a cinema, or by glancing, as one might do with a television turned on in a room, but in a segmented and tactile manner that I call grabbing. So to grab signifies multiple acts, to touch, to seize for a moment, to capture attention, and to leave open for interpretation, as in the saying, up for grabs, which raises questions of agency, permission, and power. So in the selfies piece, I argue there's about five levels of grabbing with selfies, and this probably happens with most uh, images moving around social media. So the first would be the images that we have of ourselves. Okay. The second would be the images that were circulating. The third would be the images as raw data that get grabbed by corporations and governments. And somebody's trying to pick me up, but I have to turn her off. There we go. Uh, then the fifth level is data grab from images superseding the images we produce. So uh, there's cases, for instance, on Facebook where uh, you put your real name and your photo and then somebody else says, oh no, this is a fraudulent site. And then Facebook is like, you have to give us documentation that you are you. So the grabbing just never stops, right? So I have some images here. Um, the first would be level one. So this is the creating and editing and curating part of the grab. You and your phone. Then we've got the posting and the framing and the gate keeping part. That would be you letting things out into the world. Then we've got the corporate and, and government level uh, grabbing of your data uh, through connectivity. This is the popular understanding of how this works. You're like, okay, so I've got my stuff and I know that you know I'm putting on these platforms and certain people are going to look at it. This is a more accurate understanding. Most platforms are not interested in your actual picture. They're interested in, and I don't know if you can uh, see that, uh, they're interested in things like your ISP address, your geotagging, your IP address, your location, your, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, your phone number. All of these things get, uh, get sorted and matched against other folks to make patterns. That's what Cambridge Analytica was interested in, because then they can target those patterns. Um, the last thing I want to talk about here is the, uh, the idea that every grab has a counter grab, because that's the, that's the nature of power. Uh, a gaze is kind of a one-way affair, right? Uh, you gaze at the screen, and um, it's not like the actor's going to gaze back at you. But the way grabbing works, for every push, there's a pull. So here are some examples I think are very interesting. So on the top, uh, you see uh, these two photos uh, in the If They Gun Me Down meme. And uh, that was a meme that was circulated on Tumblr when uh, the police were... Uh, they would arrest young black men and um, the media would grab a photo of them from social media and they would use that as an image of them. And uh, so they had this um, uh, meme that said, if they gun me down, which photo would they use, right? So you've got the one guy in the military outfit and then another, and another picture of him like smoking a blunt. And uh, we know which one they would use. So it's a way of kind of grabbing back, saying, actually, these two pictures are me. The, if we go clockwise from there, um, 
there is a picture of a people with a, they all look like they have a bunch of kind of nondescript white faces in a crowd. And that's correct. They are wearing surveillance masks that, um, actually anti-surveillance masks. So when they're in demonstrations and whatnot, all of the kind of grabbing of them, uh, their biometric facial data uh, gets stopped. Then below that one, um, actually, let's go to all the memes. So we see, uh, we see here the young kid uh, next to, that's Justin Timberlake. I don't know if you remember this, this happened during the Super Bowl. Um, he came and he was like dancing in the crowd and then this kid got turned into a meme. He was trying to take a selfie, but uh, he was like, you know, getting his phone ready and somebody snapped him here. And then there were like these, you know, memes that went around going, um, some guy my mom likes was here, but you know, I was, you know, on PlayStation or something. So, uh, this kid became kind of this butt of a joke circulated around and doesn't really have a lot of control over his image at this point. This becomes really interesting when you're talking about minors. Um, the image right next to that is sort of a politicized version of this, and this happens to a lot of uh, political memes. The girl in the picture, that's actually a still from a video that she took when she was crying because she didn't like her haircut. And then uh, the right wing in the United States grabbed it and they put this caption that says, I have to buy health care. Uh, this must be some evil um, conspiracy. Obama promised it to me for free, right? And so she never had anything, that photo had nothing to do with any of that. And I think at the time she tried to engage some lawyers, but you know, once something's circulating, there's not a lot you can do about it. And the very last one I wanted to suggest um, was uh, going from uh, the idea of here I am to this is me. And I, I feel like it's another way to uh, dialogue with, uh, it's almost like an anti-selfie selfie. When you take, when, when you have all these reaction shots of famous people and you say something like, this is me, clearly it's not you, but you're using it for a certain kind of, uh, we're using it for a certain kind of uh, performance. You know, it's funnier. It's a better way to respond to something. You know, if you have a reaction gif of somebody like rolling their eyes, it's, it, it's a more phatic, that is to say, more embodied way of responding than just typing, I think you're a jerk, right? And using images as speech, as communication, is a really uh, new and important way that um, not just selfies, but other kinds of images are getting uh, circulated online. And um, that one-to-one -one correspondence, that representation has always assumed between what you see and what it means uh, is slipping. So, um, you know, this is a picture of Austin Powers, but we, Austin Powers is not a person. And we also know that if you say, this is me, you're not really referencing the movie, you're referencing something about yourself, right? So it's kind of layers on layers on layers. So I think I've talked way longer um, than I wanted to, but um, I showed this last week and I wanted to kind of, again, give you this, uh, this way of thinking about grabbing and counter grabbing. You've got over here, you've got each one of these sort of visual events and they're circulating in all of these features, right? Um, again, I think that's way long enough. I'm gonna try to wrap this up. Okay, thanks, bye.